Hey, you're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to a Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Ivan Zach, and I'm here with a friend of mine, Sean Wilkie, and uh, let's introduce our guest today. Thanks, Ivan. Super excited to be with a friend of mine, Randy Velpe, probably one of the world's experts when it comes to web marketing for veterinarians and veterinary clinics. Randy's the top dog at LifeLearn and has had a very interesting career. Formerly the top dog at Pletz Plus Us. Um, During his tenure with Western Financial Company, he developed key relationships with Walmart to create their first in-store pet insurance offering, which rolled out in over 200 stores in Canada alone. Randy is on the board of directors of the Guelph Humane Society. And in 2018, his current company, LifeLearn, made the growth 500 list for the fourth consecutive year. Personally, Randy has attended a Neil Diamond show in 2012 and attended the 2013 Canadian Open, met Margaret Atwood in 2015, and has a beautiful rental that I believe is on Airbnb in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. So plug for your Airbnb rental there, Randy. We're super duper happy to have you on this episode. And I think we're going to have a fairly engaged and fun conversation. So welcome to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. Thanks very much, Sean and Ivan. And I obviously share too much of my life on social media for you to know all that stuff. Consider us internet stalkers. <laughs> That's right. Guess it could be worse. So if those are the highlights out of my social media, I'm doing okay. So we're just going to jump right into it. What would you consider a great example of veterinary web marketing? You know, that's a pretty wide question. There's lots that can go on and, and certainly different clinics do different things throughout the world and, and certainly North America where a lot of our focus is, focus is on. You know, I think for veterinarians to differentiate themselves these days, because it is such a competitive industry, it's important that they do more than just have a website. We've come across all kinds of different websites in our in our sales process, everything from where the veterinarian has had their teenage daughter or son design their website to uh, vets using GoDaddy or, or Wix, and then getting into the, the custom type of websites that our company and others provide. But I do think, you know, from that aspect, they have to differentiate themselves. Just to have a, a landing page isn't going to do it nowadays. So it's more about engaging both their current clients and obviously prospective clients if they're trying to grow their business. And that's by constantly adding different things to their websites, but also doing much more than just having a website. Today, they have to be engaged in social media, whether that be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, probably less or so to uh, LinkedIn, other properties like that. You know, unfortunately, veterinarians get very busy in their their day-to-day lives practicing medicine. So quite often, these sort of things are left aside and not focused on. And that's where us and other companies can come in and assist them to allow them to spend the time delivering the medicine that they so want to deliver, but without having to worry about the business aspects of their marketing. That's interesting, Randy. And so maybe a practical question, because we try to also incorporate some practical things for veterinarians here. What do you think on the website? What are the most common mistakes that veterinarians do? Because I've seen, obviously, we've seen quite a few websites with you know what I've done in my career in Sean. And then when you look at the website, what are the, those high-level things when you look the website and say, okay, they should not be here and these are the things that are lacking. What are five components that every vet should have? Certainly some obvious things are, you know, launching your website in 1990 and not having updated it since then. You know, websites have to be a constant work in progress. The technology changes, the styles change. So they have to be constantly reviewing that at least every two years, if not annually. I think the other thing that I see that it's not just for veterinary clinics. It's for a lot of businesses I see. They start a blog or they start some sort of newsletter with links to it from their website. And they start off great. And they post every week or a couple times a week or every month, whatever their frequency is. But then they just stop. And you go on to the clinic's website or any business's website and you go to their blog and their last posting was from 2016. You know, is that really the business that I want to be doing business with where they're not being proactive and keeping up to date on these sort of things? It does send, a, I think, a, a bad message 
to prospective clients. I mean, if you're not going to do it, then delete it. Just don't have it there. But if you are going to have it, then you've got to constantly be updating. Another thing along those same lines is, you know, staff changes and they happen in everybody's business. But for a clinic, it's very important that most websites for clinics have the team pages of the receptionists and the groomer and the veterinarian staff that those are updated as well. And I think the other big thing is that engagement that I mentioned in my opening comments is trying to engage with your clients because they want to know that they can come in there and learn from you as well. And I think for having that engagement, whether it be through a blog or certainly highlighting your Facebook with websites nowadays, you can incorporate your latest Facebook posts or the last couple of posts or Twitter posts. So they're right there on your website and you don't have to click off to go and open Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever other social platform you're looking at. That makes complete sense. Yeah, I totally agree with you on the blog and the newsletter initiative. It really has to be a strategy rather than the individual you know, initiative that never leads to anywhere, just like probably podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> you know, people go to a conference and they hear you should be doing this and they go, yeah, that's a great idea. And they come back and they instigate it. And to your point, they instigate it, but they instigate it without a plan. LifeLearn puts out a weekly newsletter. We've got our calendar mapped out for the next several months so we know what's going to be incorporated in each newsletter. Appreciating that sometimes something's going to happen and we're going to have to react quickly. But by and large, the bulk of the content is already laid out. And for veterinary clinics, it's somewhat easier to do because you can certainly create a bunch of content about seasonal things, you know, heartworm testing. So you can lay out a lot of that content ahead of time but have a plan regardless of what you're doing. That makes sense. So with veterinary clinics, you were absolutely right about the fact that they're focused on, you know, veterinary medicine and how to treat the patients. And to a degree, it's hard to engage them in the marketing activities. That's what I've found. So what is your strategy when you work with the veterinary clinic? Is it sort of partner up on the initiative? Do you take completely hands off and help them? Or do you engage with a certain goal in the clinic and help coaching them through what needs to be done to be consistent, to continuously post on social media? How does that work in terms of the uh, engagement with the staff? I think it varies by clinic and certain clinics, you know, have staff, whether it's the owner or one of the veterinarians or a practice manager that may be more business savvy than others. You know, so much of our relationships start either at a trade show or an outbound telephone call from our sales office here. I think, you know, for us, the first thing that we want to do with any client is a, a needs analysis to fully understand what capabilities they have and how much time they have to devote to these these sort of things. I mean, we can make a website as big and beautiful as any clinic wants with the content, but understanding that to add that content to really make their clinic shine is going to take a certain amount of their time for us to interview them and to get all the information that we need. Others, you know, don't have that time and may want something more simplistic but really understanding that needs analysis. The other thing is for us, you know, LifeLearn for years has done custom websites, but we also understand that that's a painful process for many clinics to change their website. So, and they may be very happy with their website. Whoever they engage to build it's done a great job, but where they need help now is uh, with SEO or custom content to help with their SEO help with Facebook and other types of marketing campaigns on Google, et cetera. So we determine all that through that needs analysis because we appreciate that one size doesn't fit all with every clinic that we talk to. And we certainly don't want to provide them with a service that they're not going to need or we're not going to miss a service that they do need in order to help grow their clinic. It's interesting, Randy, you know, that, and that makes tons of sense. You know, you've been in the vet industry for a very long time. I've got a quote here that I really, really like from 2014. To get consumers' attention, you can no longer be average. You have to be remarkable. How do the vets out there, how do these business owners that are also physicians, that are also, you know, that VP of finance, how do they be remarkable? And how do they know that, you know, your company or another web company is not just a used car salesperson trying to sell them a used car. I'm not going to name names, but uh, I could. 
Um, you know, everybody, everybody has experienced this at the different veterinary shows where you go in and there's people that are dressed in suits. They're trying to sell you the world's best thing. How do consumers put themselves on the other side of that coin and educate themselves to understand that maybe the promise or the garden path that you're being represented is not accurate? How can you help or what kind of information can you provide our listeners so that they can understand that there's some depth behind what is being pitched to them at some of these conferences? I think several things. I think first off, first impressions mean a lot in any business. And we go through a tremendous process in hiring the right people here because they've got to fit with our culture and understand our business and equally important, understand our clients' business. So I think that's first and foremost. I think the impressions that we make over the phone or the trade shows is important. And people can read people very quickly, I think, and, and get a sense for that. Additionally, for us, we have spent a lot of time and are continuing to spend time building out video testimonials on our website. So clients can go on our website and see what some of our customers are saying about ourselves and our products and their names and clinics are on there for all to, to check. Additionally, they can ask any of us for further references and, and we can help provide that information. So if they want to check it out, because for most of us in this business, it's not a one-time fee that we're delivering a website for a set dollar amount. And that's the last you're going to hear from us. Most of us run SaaS based businesses where we're providing a service for a monthly fee so you've got an ongoing relationship with us and for many of our customers i mean we're celebrating our 25th anniversary today and we just delivered a cake to a local clinic here who's one of our first customers and they've been with us for 25 years so you know it's so important to have the kind of relationship that clients will stay with us for 25 years and and still see the value and that what we're providing them is a great testimonial to life learn and just goes to everything that we're trying to do as a company. And we're trying to help the clinic's business. Again, it's not just a matter of delivering a website or a client education or anything. You know, with the heartworm season, we put out a package that clinics could then print off and do posters in their clinics. So we're helping with content for their clinic that they don't have to spend the time or have the creativity to create. So there's a number of those different things that we do to try and differentiate ourselves because at the end of the day, it's like when I was in patent insurance, it's no different for websites or anything else. You know, websites, website is website to a certain extent, patent insurance is patent insurance is patent insurance, but it's the differentiations that you have, the nuances within your product, but most importantly, it's the the staff that you have representing your, your customer that is so critical. And, you know, for us here, we have 74 employees and we have an organizational chart on our wall here and and I'm on the bottom uh, as CEO because it's really everybody else above me that's making this company successful. My only job is to keep us on track if we veer off, which we occasionally do as any company does. So that's why we spend so much effort making sure we have the right people representing us on the top of the chart. That's excellent. And what a testimony. I I want to congratulate you for a 25 year anniversary with a customer and also congratulate you for finding someone 25 years ago that you could convince that they need a website Uh, (laughs) with with the veterinarians. I mean, that's, that's incredible. It actually leads to kind of the thought that I had when you were, you you were talking about, I was just in Ontario actually last week with a veterinarian from Guelph. No, he's in Kitchener and Parkdale. I think they're a client of yours actually. And what's interesting is that, you know, I, I was just thinking about it, that it's so hard to, to explain to veterinarians what marketing is. I was just talking to him and I said, what do, you, what do you do from marketing perspective in your clinic? And I was just floored with the answer because he said, well, you know, we have a website and it's a word of mouth. And I said, well, is this a problem? Do you find that you don't find the customer? So what he said, it actually was, was very interesting. He said that our problem is not having enough clients. Our problem is processing the existing inflow. And the more you think about it, I think that our industry is actually, the demand is actually more than the supply. And the more there's consolidation, the more the turnover, and less interest from the veterinarians in building a career as a veterinarian full-time, it's actually becoming more and more true. So 
Do you see the decline in need of marketing because there's more demand than supply, or do you see people more interested in advancing their business skills and interested in marketing more recently in the last couple of years? You know, I think it, there's certain differences in uh, geography in one area in Canada and maybe different than another area in the United States. I certainly believe, especially in larger markets, it's very competitive. I'm thinking of one clinic in Burlington, Ontario, that's we got 12 competitors within a very short radius of where they're located and how they differentiate themselves because, you know, new vet moves in and they're going to start to cannibalize somebody or, or many of the other clinics in the area's business. And so for them, I think it's very important that they're still marketing, if nothing else, to maintain their position because if they don't, Someday, and this is, you know, the business has large swings sometimes, you know, in 2008, or even more reason than that, visits were down. And now for many clinics, the business is going back up. So you may not need to do the marketing today, but at the very least, you want to maintain your position because it's a lot harder and a lot more expensive to bring that back up. So if you've got the number one or second spot organically on Google results for, you know, clinics in Burlington, you want to make sure you maintain that. You know, to go lose that and be on page two now to rebuild that is going to take some effort. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So, so from the Ontario perspective, if you want to build a clinic, it sounds like you should do it in Kitchener, not Burlington. That's right. <laughs> but from um, from the vendor and provider of the services to these clinics, for example, in Burlington, I assume you have several clients in the area. How do you, as the same agency that provides with the marketing services content, how do you internally compartmentalize them as a client? And do you ever get questioned? that, you know, when you approach the client that, well, you're doing marketing for my competitors, so how would you not run into a conflict there? That's a really good question. <laughs> and it's not easy because certainly, you know, many markets, we don't have that issue. There's over 30,000 clinics and we're just one of many companies offering, especially websites. We have some products that are very unique to us, but from a website perspective, there's 17 companies just in this industry supplying websites, not to mention the GoDaddy's and the Wix's of the world and family, et cetera. So in many areas, it's not an issue for us. In other areas where, you know, we've been established like the Guelph area of Ontario or just in the surrounding area, we have many clients very close to each other. And, and it is, it's a challenge, but it's, you know, trying to, again, understand their needs, understand what makes their clinic unique and playing off of that, even though they're both providing veterinary medicine, you know, they may have grooming and kennel services. The other one may be focused on just feline, so we can play off of that. Fortunately, touch wood, I've been here two and a half years in my role, and I've never received a concern or a complaint or a comment, so I'm assuming that we're doing a good job of that, but at the same time, I know it's not easy. Awesome. So, Randy, I've got another one of your quotes here. I'm, I'm starting to like them. It's really interesting. Uh, the quote is, uh, if a new idea doesn't scare you, it's probably not that innovative. And so, you know, with that context, what are you all doing at LifeLearn that's innovative right now? T tell us a little bit more. Well, it's, it's tough, right? In this industry, as you guys know, there's a new startup weekly there's all sorts of conferences and meetings that bring these startups together and encourage other startups. So it is tough, especially for an older company like ourselves. So, you know, I guess one of the things that we did, and it's not that new, but it's certainly newer than a lot of the stuff we've done. I mean, we spent many years developing Sophie, which is our veterinary medical search tool built using IBM Watson's technology. So we launched that a year ago, and that was, I think, very innovative. It's got a, a huge runway ahead of it. It was a very expensive proposition for us, but we think we're going to see tremendous success for that. Another thing that we've done recently is we just purchased 50% of that folio. And, and CE in itself is nothing new, but it's how you deliver CE today that is unique. People no longer have an hour to sit down at their computer and, and go through a, a course. They want, you know, micro learning, you know, little snippets of education delivered in five to 10 minutes. So we're spending a lot of effort on Vetfolio right now, recognizing that and 
redoing how we deliver CE. You know, those are a couple of the things right off the top. We've got obviously plans in, in the pipe that can't get into about other things. The other part, as I said earlier, it's having the realization that we can't sell a website to everybody else. So how else can we serve the veterinary clinic? And that's when we launched an, an SEO offering, a content offering, a advertising offering this year. So not really innovative, but just recognizing that there may be areas that clinics need help because I think at the end of the day you can be innovative as all get out but if there's no demand for your product it's not really going to matter so this goes back to us really listening to our customers and what they need from us and then going away and building a solution you know the other one we launched this year was our pet nurse product an after hours telehealth triage lots of talk in the marketplace about telehealth and you know the rules and regulations and governance so that is going to be changing in the years to come so we've done our, our first launch our first phase of our launch on that with the after hours and we've got a number of clinics using that now to, to tremendous success and that also came about from listening to our customers so i think for us that's where a lot of you know innovation for lack of a better word comes from is fulfilling our clients needs very interesting. And it kind of brings to mind, you know, this understanding of micro learning and for the continuous education. But uh, I wanted to ask you what, what your thoughts are on in general veterinary education, because if we're so kind of becoming so lazy learning after school, you know, the new generations that are in school, I assume with the millennials and gen, I can follow Z, X, whatever they are, uh, they are also not as patient as the previous generation. So with the veterinary students, having less and less attention, maybe similar to their future patients, like dogs distracted by every squirrel. <laughs> do, we, do you see any changes in the potential core education with smaller bite size for the students? Is that something that may happen? Or for now, it's just sort of in a CE world? Yeah, I think it's more in the CE. I mean, I, universities out there delivering veterinary medicine, you know, not sure what their plans are. Certainly, you know, their, their audience, the students are going to start dictating to some sense that what they need. And, but the education as a, as a whole really hasn't evolved tremendously over the years. I mean, veterinary students still leave without a huge understanding of the business aspect of veterinary medicine. They've got the medicine piece down, but they really suffer with the business piece. And, and it's been like that for forever, and yet that hasn't changed. So whether universities will change and start doing the micro learning and things of that nature, I don't know. I think you should and you need to if you want to attract the right type of student, etc. But certainly once they leave the school, that's where we can assist because everybody's using their phones these days and that folio is now mobile friendly. Sophie was built around being used on a telephone. And if, if you aren't going to develop your products for the users of today, then you're going to get left in the dust. Randy, it's really interesting to hear you say that. One of our previous podcast guests, we asked him that exact question. You know, are we doing enough in veterinary education to give tomorrow's veterinarians and business owners the tools? And it was really interesting because he kind of called us out, uh, me and Ivan, he said, you guys are the opportunity to impart that wisdom in the students. And I, and I would go on to say, I think people like you as well, Randy, like coming to the vet schools and having a conversation about business and the different avenues that one can take after becoming a veterinary doctor. I mean, Ivan, you're a, you're a clear example. You went to school twice to be a veterinarian in two countries, only to do it for a little while, I think 10 years, and then to start a company. And I don't think you're going to be going back and practicing veterinary medicine anytime soon, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, not in that capacity, but the difficulty of explaining the veterinarians of the, the value of marketing or the value of any business aspect, it seems like what Dr. Cote mentioned is that student, veterinary students don't go to vet school to learn about business, so they learn about veterinary medicine. But this is an essential part of it, and when they get out of it, I think that we're, you know, I think that we're kind of missing out in the educational piece, the value of business and there's I think there's two vet schools that teach MBA within the program I think it's Colorado and Texas I'm just thinking that maybe it should be a necessary 
part of the vet school. Maybe we should be a little bit more proactive during the veterinary education. For example, for you, Randy, you know, you're co-located perfectly with the Ontario Veterinary College there. Do you have any connectivity earlier uh, sort of in their career to influence their knowledge or the direction they're going? Or is there any connection between LifeLearn and Ontario Veterinary College? Oh, for sure. I mean, we got our start. We were actually a department within the Ontario Veterinary College over 25 years ago and, and spun out of the university 25 years ago and, and created LifeLearn. So we have very close ties to the university. You know, you guys are probably familiar with the Veterinary Entrepreneur Academy uh, that was launched a couple of years ago or a few years ago. And you know, we are a sponsor of that this year. We've got a first year student finished her first year going into second uh, as an intern this year for 10 weeks because she wants to understand the business components of of the animal health industry and and so I give OVC credit I think they sponsored three or four of their students in this this year and still there's only don't quote me on this but probably less than six or seven universities that are participating in this program with Texas A&M certainly being at the forefront you know, more schools have to do that to open the students' eyes to what other opportunities are out there. And even if they stay in the veterinary medicine, to understand the business components of that, to understand the value of marketing your business, because it can make such a huge difference. I can have two clinics within five miles of each other, one having 25% growth and one having either zero growth or 2% growth. And what are they doing differently? Because they're certainly both providing the service of veterinary medicine, but one's doing something a heck of a lot better than the other. And that's where we get involved and we can show the ROI on using our products and working with us to drive that marketing. It's really interesting. You know, one of the reasons that I lament my university days is because I found that it was a perfect place to expand how I thought. And I got exposure to all kinds of different courses. But because of the prevalence of entrepreneurship and business ownership in veterinary medicine, to me, it seems like a necessary component that may be lacking quite a bit when it comes to the different vet schools across North America. So it's interesting. It's also double interesting because it's come up twice in a very few number of conversations. So kind of cool. I think there's two things what I see students not getting what they need in the schools right now. And maybe there's a couple that are doing this, but certainly by and large, one is certainly the business aspects that we've been talking about. And the other part is on the on their own mental wellness, because that has changed tremendously in the veterinary field as the population have changed from what was once a very male-dominated industry to what is becoming a very female-dominated industry. And the stresses of everyday life and the impact that is having on the mental wellness of veterinarians and their staff these days. And I don't think anyone comes out of school prepped for that. And again, that's another area that we're spending tremendous amount of efforts in uh, assisting a clinic and their staff. Um, and we're bringing courses on compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction and others to that folio to address that need as it exists today. It's very interesting that you touch on that because that came on the surface several times. And I just recently came from the human health care conference where they were talking about the burnout and the compassion fatigue. And, and uh, some of the things that they do there is they actually proactively teach courses on self-compassion, which is something that human doctors to their research are lacking is basically understanding your own needs as an individual because veterinarians are such a high impact sort of you know, they have to be leaders, a players, and represent the community. So we are lacking the, the self-compassion. So it's a very prominent topic, and I'm glad that you, um, you're also thinking in that direction because one of the things that industry is thinking about constantly, especially with consolidation, I think is the effectiveness, the efficiency, the productivity, but they don't understand the impact. And I think it will spiral if we don't think about improving the mental health of the veterinary professionals. What was interesting in that healthcare conference that I learned is that actually working uh, on improvement of that aspect and the, the, the work-life balance improved productivity, efficiency, and everything on the other end. So it's really great that you're thinking in that direction. That's so important. 
you know, those are some of the things that we do. We don't, it's just not about selling the, the next website or the selling the next package of client ad. It's really investing in our industry and in our community on all, all parts. And I think that makes us a, a good business partner for the clinics that we do work with. You're an innovator. You're a business leader. You've been in this industry since it really was an industry. What are some pieces of knowledge or books that have really struck a core with you that you would recommend to almost anybody you meet? You know, we always want to leave our listeners with a little tidbit. So anything that you're reading or have read in the TED past, talks. TED Talks, anything, anything that you'd, you'd say was really worthwhile to check out. Rightfully or wrongly, I've never got into the TED Talk um, stream as many people do, and I, I get you know, the benefit they have, and, and uh, I haven't really latched on to uh, podcasts either, but I do um, do a lot of reading, and, and I think for so many people, I mean, it's, it's so much of it is what we do is, is common sense, when we have to be, I think, unfortunately, constantly reminded of that. You know, I think, as I said earlier at the beginning of our, our talk, is the things that differentiate one company from the other, I really truly believe is the level of service that you offer. And we're all customers, regardless of what industry we are. We all go to restaurants, we go to stores, and, and I think we all have great customer service stories we can tell, and, and also ones where it was really pathetic. So I, I read a lot of business books on companies that are successful in, in leading the pack, you know, I've read books on Nordstrom, on Zappos, and again, they're doing things very similar, but they, they approach it from a different way because I think if you can connect with your clients, if you can deliver the service that they expect, that they want, but even more importantly, that you exceed their expectations, and I think this is where companies like Zappos and, and Nordstrom's have been successful. Uh, if you read their books, there's all sorts of stories that they've told of one employee doing something just totally bizarre to help a client. In my previous job, I spent a lot of time with our customer service people is, is listening to what our clients are saying. And in that case, we were a B2C business. We're dealing with the pet owner and we were having one client we'd called about their um, credit card charge hadn't gone through a month. And she felt horrible and said that she just lost a family member and everything else. And we could have just said, you know, Fine, thank you. Sorry, we uh, we understand, and you know we'll get it up to date when you're feeling better or whatever. But we actually ended up sending her flowers with a note, just you know, sorry to hear of your loss, etc. Or another story of somebody that was telling us they've been so busy and they haven't been able to do this and they haven't eaten and so whatever. But we we sent a pizza to their place, and those are the types of things that really differentiate a company from one to the other. And that's the type of books and the stories, you know, Southwest Airlines, when they got going and how they differentiated and really redid the entire airline industry and are continue to be you know, one of the more profitable airlines out there. So that's where I spend a lot of my effort. And then I also, I go to conferences and I think that's where you learn a lot too is, you know, you pick up little nuggets um, so I go to a lot of business conferences um, with business thought leaders and I'll always come home with a page or two of nuggets. Not everything's applicable to my business, but I get enough value out of there and I can bring that back. So for veterinarians, whether it's at VMX or, or some of the other conferences out there to uh, walk away with something because somebody's always doing something different from you. And, and I think the other biggest part of, of for my learning is being out there and networking because it was just saying somebody's doing something different and you can learn from that and bring that back to your business. That's very interesting about the uh, sort of out of industry conferences. What are those top sort of one or two business conferences you, you attend to get those nuggets of knowledge? There's a um, scaling up or the growth summit that's put on by a gentleman named Vern Harnish and his group called the gazelles, but it brings together twice a year, 1100 entrepreneurs essentially and a veterinarian clinic owner is an entrepreneur and they bring these people together and as I say they bring the top business minds of that year to talk and most of them have just written a book and you know might be a bestseller 
not only are you learning from the business leaders on the stage, but you're sitting with a thousand other entrepreneurs and business people. So tons of networking time. And again, you can talk about uh, what's going on in their business and in many cases relate that to your business. Mm -hmm.